Uh, cool. Um, I will start with my last slide, sort of. Um, so this paper pre presents a, a distributed system called FailD. Um, FailD is kind of interesting in that it's, uh, it decomposes load balancing uh, as a division of labor between servers and switches. Um, and so a big part of this paper is the design, namely that we leverage commodity switch hardware wherever possible. And so there's no latency cost in the expected case. Um, and then for functions that require state, we push them towards the hosts. And so in the worst case, you end up incurring a very low latency overhead. Um, but the resulting system itself is completely stateless. Um, it is incredibly efficient, um, all while ensuring that there's graceful completion of flows as you remove hosts in and out of service. Um, an interesting aspect of FailD is it's been in production at Fastly since 2013. So the paper itself has a lot of operational experience in running this. Um, and I'd say the target audience for this paper is basically anyone with an interest in transport protocols and internet architecture in particular, um, because some of the content of the, this paper will have implications uh, for future work in the area. Um, so I'll start by introducing the problem. Um, and five years ago, I joined a startup which is not the problem, by the way. Um, and I left academia. And when I mentioned this to friends, they were initially kind of excited. Um, and then I told them I was joining a CDN startup. And the reaction was widespread consternation, which was very bizarre. Um, and there was a quote from someone who's in this room, um, which was that a CDN is a solved problem because there is already a big vendor in the area, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate because I feel the networking community kind of passed by in a really exciting time in this space. So between 2009, 2012, there were lots of startups in this space and almost all of them still exist. Um, and they all arose um, as a confluence of three factors. One of them was um, that the market was ripe for the taking. Um, the incumbents in the space really addressed uh, a use case, uh, like a shrinking use case, which was the distribution of large static assets. And the nature of content was changing. And so there was a lot of suppressed demand for different new features. Um, at the same time, the cost of entry plummeted. Um, so there was um, pretty mature open source reverse proxies like Nginx and Varnish. Uh, and so it became feasible to do a CDN with off the rack kind of software. Um, but also importantly, the network topology of the internet flattened with the proliferation of IXPs. And so bandwidth costs plummeted. Um, and so you no longer really had to have a host in every ISP in the world. You could just buy equipment and you know, interconnect at co-location sites. Um, and in parallel to all that, there was a bunch of inflection points for different technologies like SSD adoption, multi-core architectures, and 10 gig NICs, and the very start of network programmability, which meant that um, incumbents had a massive cost adopting these technologies. Um, whereas if you were a startup, it was pretty cool because you could just start over, right? Um, and so that's what we and many other companies did. Um, and the fundamental building block of an edge network is just a point of presence, obviously, right? And the major design aspect of a point of presence is the notion of physical space, right? Uh, you might have one rack, you might have half a rack, you might have many racks, but space is the fundamental constraint. Um, because ultimately, this is not cloud computing data center stuff, right? you don't really get to go to a far off location in the world and build like a never ending dystopian looking server farm. Um, you have to build pops and you have to place them in some of the most densely populated and overpriced uh, places in the world, right? Um, and so you can't just forklift these cloud architectures and put them in a pop environment because you can't afford it. If you could, you could afford a boat, but you don't have a boat, so you have a rack. Um, and you can shove whatever you want in a rack. Um, it's really up to you. You just have to abide by three pretty basic um, requirements. Um, the first is you want this to be efficient. Um, and really, this means maximizing the request per second. This is what investors look at. It defines your profit margins. It dictates your economies of scale. Um, and ultimately, this is how you win an incumbent in the very long haul. Um, but at the same time, you want this to be low latency, right? Uh, because you're an edge network, you're actually the data plane for an immense amount of applications. Um, the second requirement is this has to be resilient. Um, you have to be able to absorb DDoS attacks, 
Um, and you can't really, within the architecture, have any single point of failure. Um, but beyond that, um, a pop really hosts a large distributed system. Um, and ultimately, it's all software. It has to be upgraded, and you have to you know, uh, be able to do continuous delivery of all these components. Um, and so you can't really have service disruption within maintenance. Um, so the problem statement of the paper itself is that given a fixed physical footprint, how do you design a load balancing architecture which is efficient, resilient, and graceful, right? Um, and so I'll start with a very brief overview of a topology we came up with, or we ended up deploying. Uh, it's pretty simple, very basic guidelines. If you want to maximize the number of requests per second, you have to maximize the number of hosts. <clears throat> um, you can't actually only deploy hosts. Um, you need some network equipment because of the port density and also because switches are ruthlessly efficient at what they do. Um, so you need switches to up interconnect to upstreams, right? Um, everything else, as far as we're concerned, you can burn, right? Uh, anything that's bulky and has unneeded features, load balancer appliances, even multiple switch tiers, if you can't justify it in the, the physical space, you don't actually need it. Um, and so this is kind of what a half rack of equipment for a pop looks like. Um, it's basically eight hosts connected to two switches, directly connected to a bunch of upstreams, right? Um, and from half a rack, you can actually push like 200 gigabits per second, accounting for the individual failure of a switch. Um, each host will kind of put have 96 terabytes of storage these days. And so you can put, push around 320,000 um, requests per second from half a rack. Um, scaling this architecture out, you can have more front, front end switches. Uh, so typically, in a single rack, we have four switches. Um, from there, you just um, scale out the number of hosts. So our biggest pop currently can do like 4.8 terabits per second of um, upstream, uh, and about 2.5 million requests per second with six petabytes of storage, right? And so this is a pretty efficient use of space. Um, and so how do you load balance within this sort of architecture? Um, so um, one whole set of solutions we have to discard is anything that keeps state. Um, so that includes load balancer appliances, um, but also a lot of the literature from the cloud computing space, uh, stuff like Ananta, Duet, Maglev, and Silk Road, um, don't really easily fall into this kind of use case. Um, at the same time, uh, software-only load balancers uh, can't really make use of the full bisection bandwidth because of the topology we, were, we, we came up with, right? Uh, because of the physical constraints. Um, and finally, the uh, stateless solutions that are commonly used are really not graceful. Um, so many switch ECMP implementations actually result in rehashing every time you try to change the routing table. Um, even the ones that don't, for the bucket that you're reallocating, you're necessarily going to break the transport protocols, right? Um, and so you'll end up resetting ongoing connections. Um, and so the thing we came up with is called FailD. Um, and um, it's conceptually pretty simple. Um, so the idea is, in a switch, you can uh, program the routing table in such a way that you map a VIP to a static set of virtual next hops. Um, so these are completely made up IPs. Ignore them. Um, what using a static set of virtual next hops means, though, is that the routing table is fixed. And so you don't actually rehash if you change it because of ECMP rehashing. Um, at the same time, you have a controller on the switch that instead of manipulating the routing table, actually manipulates the MAC address. And the idea is that for each virtual next hop, you end up mapping to a virtual MAC address. Uh, and that MAC address actually encodes the target host within the pop uh, in the address itself. And so the idea is you have a transitive relationship between the VIP and what target host you want in the pop. Um, and then you have to configure the bridging table to map virtual Mac to egress port, but that's an implementation detail, really. Um, the idea now is that, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so if uh, a flow maps that particular routing entry, you're going to end up in server B, right? Um, and the idea now is that if um, hosts can communicate, can communicate with the switch controller, right? Um, and so if server B wants to remove itself from service for upgrade, um, it can just notify the controller, and the controller can remap the, Mac, the ARP table entries to map to new healthy hosts, right? 
Um, and in this case, the entry that was previously mapping to B is now mapping to C. Now, this change will necessarily break any transport connection that was ongoing, right? Um, and if you're asking yourself if this isn't just consistent hashing, it absolutely is. It's consistent hashing in hardware, uh, but the beauty is we can now extend this mechanism to avoid resets entirely, right? Um, and the way we do this is just embedding more information in the MAC address. Um, so the idea is, uh, in addition to the current host, which is kind of reflects the current state of the pool of servers, uh, we can actually also encode the previous host into the same uh, address, right? Um, the switch can't actually make any use of this information, um, but it does convey the necessary information down to the host. Um, and so now um, the host decides what to do next. Um, and so another component of failD is the host side processing, which is a kernel module. Um, and the kernel module is actually incredibly simple. Um, so given an inbound packet, in this case encoding two pieces of information, which is the current host and the previous host, um, we first check if the current host matches the previous host. Uh, and if it doesn't, we have to do a slightly slower path. Um, we verify if the packet is actually a SYN packet, in which case we process it locally. Um, if it is not a SYN packet, we verify whether the packet belongs to an existing socket uh, connection in, in the socket table. And if it is, we locally process it. Um, if none of these three conditions are met, it must mean that the packet we received actually belonged to the previous host on the ring, right? Uh, at which point we can redirect it back to the original server, which is going to undergo maintenance, but is still effectively uh, serviceable, right? Um, and so now we punt the packet back to the original host. Um, the difference now is we apply the exact same host processing, but the difference now is that um, in the MAC address, we've encoded the previous host and the current host, and they now match. So we immediately short circuit processing and receive the local packet, right? Um, so the paper has uh, a lot of benchmarking and evaluation around this. Um, really, the, the important things to note is that um, this is extremely low latency. Um, in the expected case, the switches do all the heavy lifting, right? Um, in the worst case, the detour routing costs us a median of 14 microseconds, uh, and that includes the actual network delay. Um, it's also got a negligible impact on CPU utilization to the point we had difficulty measuring it. Um, really, you only notice the impact uh, while refilling a host, which is a transient event in itself. <laughs> Uh, and peak CPU utilization was below 0.3%. Um, now, um, a big part of this paper is the operational aspect of it. Um, and so we deployed this in late 2013. Um, and we grew a lot since, um, to the point we do like 300 billion requests per day, or uh, we do a number. Um, and uh, so at this point, we suspect it works. Um, but um, there was a bunch of assumptions kind of broken along the way that we had to work around. And the paper really details that aspect of it. Um, and some of these assumptions, I mean, they look ludicrous, right? Like one of them, this one looks pretty naive. Uh, the hash buckets are equally loaded. Uh, you'd think people implement this correctly. Um, and this is important because if you're using ECMP to load balance between your backends, um, you would like the buckets to be equally loaded so that roughly they get the same number of requests per second. Uh, and this has really important implications for capacity planning. Right? You are bound by the most loaded host in a cluster. If one node receives more traffic and falls over, you have the risk of a cascading failure. Um, so um, we actually tested switches um, and uh, after we had some problems. Uh, this was an ordering problem. Um, and we injected synthetic equally distributed traffic into some of these switches. And normally you'd expect for every next hop to receive uh, the same amount of load. Um, this is what we actually measured. Um, uh, and in one of our platforms we had significant skew where the most loaded bucket was six times more loaded than the least loaded. Um, so it turns out vendors don't necessarily test this very well. Um, and most people don't notice because they just buy the equipment. Um, but these are out there. Um, and the other thing we notice is the behavior can depend on the number of next hops you actually configure. Uh, 
uh, which is amazing. So if you configure 256 next hops, they might all get some traffic. If you configure 255, all of a sudden there are eight buckets that receive absolutely no traffic. Um, we actually engaged with a vendor and fixed this, uh, but it was not fixable. So they're out there as well. Um, a second assumption is that switches hash identically. Um, and this is kind of important for us because we have multiple ingress switches to each pop. Um, and so uh, the basic premise is if we send a packet through one switch, uh, if we were to send the same packet through another switch, you'd hope they hash onto the same host. Um, if it doesn't, it means that any flow that is flapping between ingress switches will end up uh, getting reset. Um, unfortunately, historically, vendors thought hash polarization was a bad thing uh, because their main use case was completely different. Um, and so what you'll find is in many cases, you cannot actually configure the seed or any aspect of the hashing function. Um, in my favorite case, you can configure the seed, but the vendor additionally uses boot order of line cards to add entropy. Um, yeah, I can't even explain how we found that out. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. I don't know what they do, they're doing. Um, so um, we actually had a case where we, we actually bought some of these switches which didn't actually have allow you to have equally uh, identically hashing switches. Um, and if we break that assumption, this assumption is killer, which is that you assume that packets in a flow use the same network path. Um, there's actually a lot of cases where this doesn't happen. Um, so almost immediately upon start, obviously, the, the, the problem of fragmentation and that ICMP packets hash on the outer header. Um, we took the draft of that to the ITF in 2014. Um, ECN was another problem. We found that middle boxes hash on the type of service field. Um, we ended up turning ECN negotiation off. Um, and we're still looking kind of for the middle boxes that do this, but we haven't really figured it out. It seems that there is more than one. Um, also, there's a case of SYN proxies. Um, this is where one box will negotiate the handshake and then offload the connection to another box. And so they actually end up using separate network paths. Uh, we've actually worked with one vendor to fix an implementation, but they keep kind of cropping up. And this seems to be more popular recently. Um, and really, I'll, I'll defer to the paper to lots of gnarly kind of details, like SYN cookie handling and lots of switch measurements and stuff. Um, we like This was an interesting process for us coming from industry. Um, because uh, the reviewers really latched onto things we didn't really expect. They were very particular. Um, you know, stuff like the layer two architectures don't scale, and that we didn't use P4 or eBPF and DPDK. Um, this was very, very specific stuff. I was, we were quite surprised. Um, and so, if you do read the paper, I would, I would, like reinforce that the value of the paper is not in the implementation, right? Like, frankly, if we wanted an implementation review. The last place we would go is an academic conference, right? Um, and you know, layer two doesn't scale, but you can actually use any NCAP method you want. Uh, we didn't use P4 because it didn't exist. Arguably, still doesn't. Um, we didn't use eBPF or DPDK because they don't really provide the value for us that the implementation cost actually like reflects. Um, so these are not like big things, right? Um, the value of the paper is in the design. Um, and really, if I want you to take anything away, is that like FailD was kind of pioneered this approach of, of breaking load balancing as a division of labor. Um, we, we have a case where we leverage switch hardware to imp do the bulk of the work. Um, and then pushing out the state to the hosts dramatically simplifies the overall architecture. Um, the result is efficient, resilient, and graceful. Um, and obviously, we adopted lots of design patterns, and lots of these lessons are applicable to other networking environments. But that's not actually why we published the paper. Uh, the reason we published the paper is because the design is now part of the architecture, right? Um, and FailD is a small part of a very significant shift in the economics of edge delivery over the last decade, right? And um, the underlying cost structures, uh, the uh, economic underpinnings that gave rise to the design could not be reasoned with. Um, and so the design patterns represent such a magnitude of savings that they have kind of percolated through the industry. And we have been dealing with the consequences of this ever since. Uh, we took the PATH MTU discovery stuff to ITF. 
Uh, we have been trying to fix stuff with vendors, uh, and middle box vendors in particular. We've had some success, but there's still stuff out there. Uh, and this is part of raising awareness within the transport community and academia. Uh, so if there's any takeaway, I would say if you propose transport protocol changes or work in this area, uh, please read the paper and take the lessons into account. Um, this was kind of a short talk, but we have lots of material published in the past if you want to read up more on it. And I really recommend the Nanog 70 talk to see what pissed off vendors sound like. Uh, thank you. I will take questions now. All right, I'll ask the first question. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if you think your life will get different and maybe easier if you could change the transport protocol. You know, if the transport protocol did not expose the end of a TCP connection as a user visible error, would it make this whole task a lot easier? Or if you could propose any change you want in the transfer protocol, what would it be? Uh, we're working with a quick community on that right now. Um, so part of it is whether the connection ID on quick should be encoded or not. The, really, the the fundamental part is that you need something to hash on on the switch that follows some sort of flow affinity so that subsequent packets can be identified as belonging to a specific flow. Uh, really beyond that, we don't need much else. It will just take a very long time to get the switch hardware to do the right thing. Um, the real risk is, um, depending on how you do it, most of the switch hardware would become um, would have some visibility into the transport protocol. So it's not obvious we'll see the network component of that first. And certainly on the quick spec, it's changing too fast to do anything on the switch hardware side of things. Um, there's been like five specs in the last year and a half, I think. Uh, and that's crazy to kind of embed any sort of intelligence into the network to try and hash those connections. Um, so yeah, there is some space for, for stuff like that. But I would be very, very reticent in the wide area networking case, because no one knows what's actually being pushed out, <laughs> uh, and things will break. Uh, fundamentally, don't trust vendors. <laughs> so have you had any real luck with uh, working with the merchant silicon or programmable silicon to zero out the sixth source of entropy? Uh, we have not even tried. I'm sorry? Sorry, is it real? could you repeat? I said, have you had any luck working with silicon vendors to zero out the sixth source of entropy? Um, so, no, but that was an older platform. It's been deprecated. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So it seems so you're like solving it's being phased out. Now. It was last sold in 2015. Okay. Um, Fair enough. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, let's thank our speaker again.